And welcome to all of you. It's so nice that we can do these things in person again. Um, Fuchsia has already been sort of introduced, but I will take a few seconds to, to kind of give my view on this, because I have to say, Fuchsia, when, when starting to, you know, to, to look at the various videos you did and, and, and sort of dive a bit deeper into what you've done, I can't, it can't contextualize you differently than there's sometimes some people who come along that become a bit more than just sort of a, a spectator of what's going on. And Nico already said that. You, you're a chef, you cook, you make the food, but you also write about it, you talk about it. There's, there's so many layers. But I really feel that there's a sense of an education that you really want to get across. The way that you contextualize everything that's going on in the broader culture. You really try to raise an understanding of the different food cultures, of, of the food being a mirror of the, again, culture. And I've, I've been thoroughly impressed by that. And I have to say, for, for the purpose of this talk, I really want to start by asking you, I guess about your personal journey with this, because this sort of a spark and this sort of a passion for this thing that is so remarkable. So where is that from? <laughs> I, I guess I'm asking about the origins of this intense, intense interest. Yeah, well, um... So the food thing started practically from birth, according to my mother. Okay. Um, and certainly when I was a child, I loved cooking more than anything. Mm. And when I was 11, I remember telling a school teacher that I wanted to be a chef when I grew up. So, and I went on cooking pretty seriously during my teens. And if I hadn't been academic, I probably would have gone to a restaurant or a chef school, but I ended up going to university and studying English literature. But um, I just like traveling. And um, one of the early jobs I had was a sort of editorial job where I was reading lots of stuff about the Asia Pacific region. And um, I just went backpacking in China. And this is 1992. So China was another world then. It was very, very different. And um, I spent a month there. And I just was really interested. So I came back to London and I signed up for Mandarin evening classes. Mm -hmm. Very slow progress, once a week. <laughs> And then I, I went to a summer school in Taiwan for two months. And then I had this, I heard about these British Council scholarships to go and study in China for a year. And um, so I, it basically was an excuse to go and have adventures and yeah. learn a bit more Chinese. Mm -hmm. um, but I chose Sichuan, partly because I traveled there the previous year and eaten extremely well. So I had a very good first impression of Sichuanese food, which was just like, May, I mean, it was just like eclipsed any other Chinese food that I'd had in you know that period in Britain, which was mainly a sort of anglicised Cantonese food. So it was so fresh and so exciting. And also, apart from that, so I'd only had a little taste of it, but also Sichuan had a reputation for being one of the best places in China to eat. And as I already said, I loved eating. So I wanted, and I didn't want to be an expat. I didn't want to spend all my time with foreigners. So I didn't want to go to Beijing, where most people did for language. And also, I love traveling. And um, Sichuan is, it's on the, on, it's in this amazing region on, you know, next to all the mountains. It's, you know, you just go a little further west, and essentially you're in Tibet. And so I did some of the most incredible traveling you can possibly imagine, I mean, in those days. But anyway, so that's why I went to Sichuan. And I was supposed to be doing something very academic, but initially my Chinese wasn't really good enough, so I just concentrated on the language. Mm -hmm. And then I just did what I had done since I was a teenager, which was I started writing down recipes. And literally, I've got my notebook from the first September 1994 when I went to live in Chengdu, and I was writing down everything in the market, everything I was eating. <laughs> And so, and then I just, and there were all these amazing little restaurants near the university. Um, and I, you know, I became friendly with the owners and I used to say, can I come and study in your kitchen? And at the time, like, you know, foreigners were a source of great curiosity in China that most Chinese people haven't met anyone, any foreigner. And they just found it kind of weird and hilarious that there was this woman, foreigner, yeah and a university student who wanted to be in a kitchen. So lots of people said yes. So I sort of started learning you know, informally and taking notes and stuff. And then this German friend and I heard about a famous local cooking school. So we went over there together and kind of persuaded them to give us some private classes, which were just the highlight of my time. I mean, it was just, it was amazing. And so we were eating all this wonderful food. and. Uh, for a foreigner, like I was already quite a serious cook in a more French sort of tradition, but the whole grammar of Chinese cuisine is different and I didn't know the basic processes or the cutting. So I started learning it in these private classes. 
And then when I finished at the um, university, I just went to say hello to my teachers. And I kind of wanted to stay in China, but I didn't have a plan. And they just said, we have this chef's training course starting. Amazing. Why don't you join in? So of course I said yes. And so then I was just in at the deep end with 50 young Sichuanese men and two women learning Sichuanese cookery in Sichuan dialect. And so, yeah, and, and that was really, so that was like a very good professional grounding and that's where it all started. That's amazing. I mean, it's, that's quite, quite the journey to do that. <laughs> do you remember the first thing you ate there? In Chengdu. Mm -hmm. Well, I do remember, and I think I wrote about this in my memoir, the Shark's Finna Citron and Pepper. But um, so when I first went to Chengdu a year before I lived there, um, I looked up this musician who I'd met in Oxford, my <coughs> hometown, and he and his wife took me around. And they took me to this little restaurant near the bus station, mm -hmm. and um, it was just a very plain place. And we just had this extraordinary meal with, um, and I remember one of the dishes was. Which is um, fire exploded kidney flowers. And um, I, they just presented this beautiful dish. And he said, So, what, what do you think this is? And there were all these little frilly things with pickled chili and a bit of you know, green. I, I didn't know what it was. And it was pig's kidney, but just cut so beautifully and so elegantly flavored. It's amazing. And anyway, so I had this that's one of the things I remember. It's just thinking, yeah. I suppose, the first sight of the transformational qualities of yeah. Chinese cuisine. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that's a really beautiful uh, sort of segue to a question I had actually planned for later on, but I will ask you now, because one of the things that stands out for me when you talk about this is the, the textures. Mm. So apart from the flavors and the spices that we will dive into in a little bit, so also please don't open your little bags, we will all do it together. Um, but the, the richness of textures, the meaning of textures. So sort of the question is, can you talk about that a little bit? And maybe in a broader sense, can you talk a little bit more about what makes Sichuanese cuisine so very special? Okay. Well, so the texture thing, um, I think like many foreigners, faced with, you know, just real Chinese food all the time and eating with Chinese people all the time in a totally Chinese context, um, there were a lot of ingredients that I just found completely baffling. Mm -hmm. So there were, in Sichuan, there were all these slithery, rubbery things with essentially no flavor. So of course they were served in a lovely sauce or in hot pot, but they were just, there was no equivalent in any Western cuisine. Mm -hmm. So like, why would you eat a goose intestine? I thought it was like a rubber band or something, plastic bag. You know, it's just like it's just like rubbery and no flavour. Why would you eat it? Yeah. And I think that's, and we just don't have any sort of way of appreciating these things. Yeah. And so I was brought up to eat everything very politely, and also I was very enthusiastic about China, so I wanted to eat everything anyway. But for a long time, I ate these things without really enjoying them. Mm -hmm. And then at a certain point, through exposure, I guess, I started really enjoying the textures. Because that, it's it sort of, it's, it's hard to express really the importance of texture in Chinese food because it's just, it's totally part of the appreciation of food. It's not some extra add-on. Mm. It's like when Chinese people talk about flavor or a dish, it's always about the tactile sensory qualities as well. It's, it's just totally instinctive. Yeah. And so it's just that it's, there's this immense pleasure in the different textures of food. So I would say in European cuisines, we have a narrow range. So we like um, dry, crisp things, and we like soft things and succulent things. But we don't like slimy, slithery, or kind of wet, crisp things like chicken cartilage. Like they're, they're quite minority things for, for a lot of Westerners. Yeah. Some people like them, but and it's just that in, in in a Chinese context, they're all part of the pleasure. And it's it the contrast in all these different textures is one of the things that makes eating so delightful. And um, and so but it, for me it was like um, opening a door in my brain. It's like first of all it's just a bafflement and then thinking, well um, this is kind of interesting. And also, because another, I mean, people have often asked, like, why, you know, I was very adventurous and I would eat everything in China. And one of the reasons is that, like, the Chinese really understand good food. They really understand how to eat, like, no one else. And, like, people yeah. in China have been, you know, really considering gastronomy for 2,000 years. You know, it's a very sophisticated food culture. So, 
I was kind of, you know, in a way, like if my Chinese friends were enjoying something, my thing would be, well, they're onto something that is, is worth learning about. <laughs> and so that is one of the things. And I think, but I think, and so I've written quite a lot about texture. And in that memoir, there's one chapter which I had a lot of fun writing because I think it's hilarious, like all the sort of Western barrier about it. And also because a lot of the language we use in English sounds so unattractive, like slimy. Yeah. So it's trying to how I was trying to both have fun with these stereotypes, but also trying to find beautiful ways of expressing this, like sort of slippery or silken or you know d a different way. And anyway, so I wrote a lot about this, and quite a number of readers have written to me and said that it really changed their way of thinking about Chinese food because they hadn't, they just hadn't really considered why you might eat a goose intestine or. So it's like, and once you can see, once you see that this is a positive, it's like an extra dimension of gastronomy. And I also feel like anyone who wants to really enjoy Chinese food, so China kind of has everything apart from really dairy products and chocolate traditionally. But you know, they're, they're, they're all, there are kind of amazing dishes to suit almost any taste, you know, dumplings, roasts, stuff, you know, all, there's so much there. But if you don't appreciate texture, there's always going to be a whole subsection that you're not really going to get. But once you can sort of um, open your palate up to the pleasures of texture, then it's like the whole of Chinese food is there for appreciation, which is very life enhancing. And that was a very good example of how I think she contextualizes everything so well into the culture, right? This is so beautiful to hear that. And it's so enriching, I, I really think. For me too, I mean, the thought even, right? To even think about, also the value in one interview, you talk about a goose tongue. You know, every goose just has one tongue. And so eating that is like really representative of, of it's it's an entire animal, it only has one, right? Yes. So these, these sort of... Oh yeah, that's one, yeah, that's another thing maybe to point yeah. out. Another thing is that, but I think often, um, you know, Westerners have taken a very negative view of sort of culturally yeah. distinctive things. So, for example, like the idea, so duck tongues, like why would you eat a duck tongue? I've actually written a whole article about it. <laughs> but from a Western point of view, it's like, why would you bother? Like, there's no meat on it. It's small and trivial. It's kind of awful. You just throw it in the bin. Like, who would bother? The, the complication of eating a duck tongue. And so there's this idea in Western, a lot of Western commentary on Chinese food that Chinese people eat these things because they were poor and desperate yeah. and that that's why they would eat them. But this is not true in the sense that like, like, anyone, like in any agrarian culture, people tend to eat a lot of offal. So you, you kill a pig and you eat a lot of it. So modern Westerners don't so much, but you know my grandparents, Italian farmers, you know everyone ate more awful than we do now. Um, but also in China, and of course, like in times of famine, you know Chinese people would eat wild plants and things they wouldn't yeah. eat. But at the same time, at the very highest level of Chinese gastronomy, people have always sought out excitement and difference and kind of thrills of eating and. And one, and, and another way, yeah, as you just mentioned, so like a duck tongue, there's another way of looking at it, which is that, you know, you have a whole duck and it has this one precious little tongue, like it's the prize. If you could afford to have a whole plate full of duck tongues, it represents your command of a whole flock of ducks. It's a privilege. And it's the same with like goose feet, an extremely luxurious food. And so it's just like when you think about it like this, it's it's a sort of it's not just sort of eating anything. Yeah. It is a kind of cultural predilection for being adventurous and appreciating the possibilities of food. And I actually just here, I just have to mention one of the most amazing dishes I have eaten in like 25 plus years of eating in China. Please. It's called Tubu Liolian, and it was a Hangzhou dish, which I was told was served to President Nixon when he visited. So it was in his restaurant, and there was a bowl on the table, and it was like a sort of soupy dish with all these little white morsels of white flesh. But they were the cheeks of 200 fish. No. 400 <laughs> fish cheeks. You know, the, the cheek of the fish is a great delicacy. And just the psychological thrill of tasting this amazing dish and also because the honor of sharing it because you're at the high table everyone else is just eating the fish and only one table yes yeah. yeah yeah anyway yeah 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 that's that's quite something how big are they well they were about 
which has maybe a thumb must there. be. They were little fish, and there were four hundred in a small box. Also, maybe I'm taking this too far, but even the the patience of the chef to prepare that, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like the human intention to make this for you. I mean, not just the amount of fish that that represents, but the the, the minute preparation yeah. of that must have been incredible. And, and I think that you know, in, in sort of in a, in the Western context, often um, you, you sort of signify the status of a feast yeah. by the vintage wines. And there are yeah. some foods that signify that, like caviar, smoked salmon used to be like mm -hmm. that. But in China, it's there's a lot of there's a lot of that going on with food. Like if you want to honor someone or butter them up or corrupt them, then you, you give them like really incredibly special and privileged food. You know, they get me like that too, though. <laughs> yeah. uh, you mentioned drinks. What do you drink there typically? What's the? Do you drink with food, or is this sort of a separate? Uh, well, so it's a little complicated. So formal banquets, you always would drink. And these days, often baijiu, which is a very, very strong grain liquor. Mm -hmm. And um, this is one thing I never really get my head around because it's very formal toasting. Okay. So um, I have had several, many frustrating day, you know, banquets when you go in and there's all these amazing cold dishes on the table, like a dozen beautiful dishes. And before you can eat them, you have to toast many, many little cups of baijiu, and it's very, very strong. So it's quite formal, and um, at formal on formal occasions in China, you know, so traditionally you don't normally just have a sip of wine when you fancy it, mm. you know, because I think in a sort of English context, you might have a toast at the beginning and then you just drink at your own pace. Absolutely. But in China, it's a very sociable thing. And so I usually end up either being with friends who are very abstemious and not being able to drink when I fancy it, or being forced to get drunk when I don't want to. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, but anyway, so that's the formal context. Mm -hmm. um, and then also, well, the, the Shaoxing wine, which is more like a sherry sort of strength, and has a very wonderful cultural significance and is actually wonderful. Um, so, so that's another sort of one. But, but I think um, one thing that's quite interesting, and then these days people drink beer, and actually red wine is very trendy now. So a lot of my friends like red wine, which they drink in toasts in a Chinese way, but it's red wine. Um, but the other thing is that at a lot of Chinese meals, um, you don't necessarily have a drink, you have a soup. And, um, and that's one real difference, that a Chinese meal almost demands to have a soup. Yeah. And, um, you know, in, in Western cooking, a lot of our soups are very thick and pasty and substantial, right? And you have them as a separate course. But in China, a lot of their tongue is like a light broth, which is a palate cleansing thing. And that's often, like in the countryside, often, or, you know, informal meals at home, you wouldn't necessarily have a drink, but you have a soup, and that serves as a drink. You talked about the significance of lighter dishes in the context of that before, and I, I would wonder, you know, sort of the, the makeup, the orchestration of a of a meal. Yeah. How, how does that fall into place? Yeah. Well, this is a real art, and actually, because one thing, you know, you asked me about previously, which I didn't answer, was about Sichuanese food, yes. and this is very related. So, of course, when people think of Sichuanese food, they think spice, heat, mala, yeah. numbing and hot. And it's true that this is a very distinctive flavor of Sichuan food, and it really, that combination of chili and Sichuan pepper really says Sichuan. But actually, it's an incredibly subtle and varied cuisine. And um, local chefs will say that the thing about Sichuanese cuisine is yi cai yi bai cai bai wei, which mm -hmm. means each dish has its own style, and 100 dishes have 100 different flavors. So a good Sichuanese meal is not all ma la, unless you have hot pot, which is a sort of separate category. So if you're having a well-planned menu, the whole point is that there's a lot of variety. So if you have one mala dish, which is really hot and spicy, then maybe you'll also have a yuxiang, fish fragrant dish, which is a completely different sort of heat. So it's a mellow, fruity heat of pickled chilies with ginger, garlic, spring onion, a bit of sweet and sour. You might have hong yu wei, a, a salad with a chili oil dressing with a bit of soy sauce or something. And um, so the chili itself is used in lots of different ways, sometimes very hot, sometimes very mild. And, um, and the whole point of a well-planned menu is you don't repeat. So you don't want two sweet and sour dishes, two mala dishes, really. You, everyone should be different. Every main ingredient should be different. Um, but also, um, 
the, uh, another thing about Chinese food, and this is one of the worst Western stereotypes about Chinese food, that a lot of people associate Chinese food, particularly in America, with sort of takeout food, and people think that it's unhealthy. And like, no one knows about food and health better than the Chinese. So since the very origins of Chinese civilization, food has been considered as the, the foundation of good health, and people have used food as medicine. And um, a good Chinese meal is not just about being very tasty, although it is. It's also about sort of balancing and, and making you feel good. And um, so for that reason, if you have a lot of very strongly flavored dishes, you usually will have plain rice, and you'll have some very mild dishes, like stir-fried greens, a very light soup is typical of Sichuanese cooking. And, um, and the whole point is that you, it should, you know, and I always say this, like, with a, if you go out for a really luxurious Western meal, you often just feel comatose and stuffed afterwards. So it's incredibly delicious, but you're just stuffed. Whereas I, I went with a Malaysian Chinese friend to um, the Fat Duck in England, you yeah, know, the yeah. famous restaurant yeah. at Heston Dubathon. We had the most amazing, surprising, delicious, wonderful meal, but we were both like, we had about I know, <laughs> a whole lot of sweet, heavy dishes, and we were just sort of knocked out by the end of it. And she, she said to me, you know, Fuchsia, the thing is, if you went for a Chinese banquet, even if you had 40 dishes, you would end up maybe with fruit, a light soup, and it would leave you feeling really shuffle, really well, really comfortable. Um, and that's the thing. So if I'm planning a Chinese menu, you know, I'm cooking, um, I, I, there will always be some mild dishes. And you want people to have delicious sensory experience, but you also want them to feel kind of looked after and well. And it's, you don't have to have like rich food one day and then raw kale the next day as a kind of penance. Yeah, yeah. With Chinese food, you can sort of have the gluttony and the antidote at the same meal, which mm -hmm. I think is great. Mm -hmm. so. in, in Chinese culture, specifically in Sichuanese culture, how often a day do you really tend to eating? Is it sort of one major event a day, or do you really... Because you mentioned they eat earlier, for example, at dinner, typically. Yeah, so, I mean, you know, people will have breakfast and lunch, you know, lunch is often casual just because people are out, mm -hmm. and then, but I mean, it just depends on, I mean, it's sort of three meals a day, but yeah. dinner is much earlier usually in Sichuan, so six or yeah. and One thing that I asked you before, because I'm just always so curious about it, is sort of the setting. So what are the kitchens like? Do you eat in the kitchen? Do you, it's a little bit like paint the picture, yeah. but I would love to hear more about that. Also the experience, I mean, we're looking at these beautiful pictures behind us, the experience of shopping, the market, sort of the surrounding of what do you hear, and then we should also probably talk about the actual spices a little bit. So yeah. before we get into those, maybe you can paint the picture of sort of the the how do you shop, what are the markets like, how, the, the cutting is so interesting to me, so sort of a little bit of surrounding. Well, let's, say, let's start with the kitchen, right? Yes. So, I mean, and very recently, people in China have started having fitted kitchens. Do you know, like they've become a sort of design feature of the home, but they really weren't. And actually, when I was living in Sichuan, and kitchens were very functional, and in the countryside also, you'd have a, a sort of wood-burning stove often with very interesting, a design that hasn't changed that much for 2,000 years mm -hmm. with um, these great walks and steamers and things like that. But, um, but one of the things that is really um, amazing about Chinese food is that the, the tools are so simple. So it's like practically all you need is a cleaver, which is actually much lighter than you think. Mm -hmm. It's not a, th there are heavy choppers for cutting through bones, but the Chinese cai da, vegetable knife, cutting knife, is actually very lightweight. Mm -hmm. And um, so you need a cleaver and a board, and you need a wok and a steamer, and maybe a clay pot for a stew, and um, you know, a rice pot, and then you sort of label wok scoop. Mm -hmm. So it's a very small, like one knife, basically. And, um, and yet, this incredible complexity of different cooking methods. And um, so, you know, you have a few tools which are incredibly versatile. There's a, a very nice um, um, young Chinese sort of design, graphic designer who I follow on Instagram. She's called uh, Tiny Eyes. And she does very lovely sort of graphics and cartoons and things. She lives in Paris, I think. But she did this wonderful um, illustration of um, 
her, her Paris kitchen and there was a knife rack with like about six or seven knives of different sizes and then my Beijing kitchen with one knife yeah. <laughs> so anyway so I would say the kitchen is just and that's one of the things that I is so kind of magical is the, this simplicity and complexity of what you're actually doing with it mm-hmm. um, and then in terms of shopping I mean that's one thing that um, that I loved about Sichuan. And sadly, there aren't as many markets now mm. since redevelopment, but when I lived there in the 90s, every small district had its own market, and there are still some lovely markets in Chinese cities. And um, just the produce is so fresh, and in particular, the leafy greens, like they have, every region has little varieties, They're often just called qing tai, like green vegetables. And they are so sort of um, fresh and tender and lovely. And um, and one of the great joys for me about Chinese eating in China is the vegetables, because people eat such a huge range of vegetables, and they don't eat them out of duty. They eat them because they're so delicious. You know, it's a really and that's something that you do not see in Chinese restaurants in the West, because um, I think partly um, like. Um, People, I, I was talking to a Shanghainese friend in London and she said she was always trying to explain to her Western friends that they, they couldn't understand why a plate full of greens in a Chinese restaurant was so expensive, you know. And she was trying to explain, it's not a side dish, it's a dish, <laughs> you know, it's, it's yeah. an important part of the yeah. meal yeah. and the portions are bigger and it's, you know, but just that in, in, I think, in, you know, Chinese restaurants where a lot of the customers are not Chinese, people won't pay for vegetables. And also, of course, you don't have the range abroad because they're imported, a lot of them. But um, yeah, I mean, just glorious, fresh bamboo shoots. You know, you can't, they're just like tin bamboo shoots, not worth eating fresh ones. I amazing. believe that. Even, I mean, looking at the pictures that are going on behind us. Can you talk about them a little bit, Fusha? What, what yeah, so these, um, these pictures were taken by a, a friend of mine for my book. So we went on a trip around Sichuan, Ian Cumming. And um, so this is the beautiful landscape of southern Sichuan. So the previous image, rice paddies, brilliantly green, and then bamboo. And of course, you can eat the young bamboo shoots. And also there are all kinds of sort of mushrooms and other plants in the bamboo forest. This is an old town in southern Sichuan, so, um, which is less developed. And so you see all this very lovely architecture. And this is a place where various universities moved during the war to escape Japanese bombing. And um, mm. but it's now a backwater, but it's absolutely lovely. And in fact, this kind of architecture, um, to a certain extent, Chengdu, the capital city, looked like that in the 90s. But it's all gone. But there were these, um, yeah, let's see. Um, I think there's something interesting coming up. <laughs> this is a lotus pond, and um, so you can use the leaves for wrapping food, for steaming. The root is a delicious vegetable. The seeds are a, a kind of, they're used in all kinds of dishes, and they're a symbol of fertility. Oh, stop yeah. on this one. Yeah. So this is, um, this was a rather wonderful, um, we came across. So this guy was catering for a village funeral. So it was a big feast for everyone in the village. And this is what you would call the xiang chuzi, a village chef. So it would be someone who lived in the village, who not really necessarily a professional chef, but who would be hired to do the catering for a big event, like a wedding or a funeral. And so you can see that he's built some stones out of bricks and um, is just cooking in vast quantities. And one of the things that, you know, people always think of stir frying with Chinese cooking but steaming is equally distinctive and important and it's particularly good for catering for large numbers of people because you can prepare all the food and put it in the steamers and then when you want to serve it you just whip all the bowls out of the steamer and you know one on each table um, and I think there's some more of that yeah coming up so this is then preparing the chilies yeah. this is his team of, of workers and they were catering for quite a lot of people yeah it's right that they, they were just coming up um, yeah, and um, and then here, yes, the next one, the next picture, yeah, here, I think he must be making tofu there, do you see, a oh, huge yeah. um, mould lined with, um, but anyway, so they're doing all the prep, and quite a lot of the food will go into bowls and be steamed for hours, and then... So anyway, that was just really interesting because you don't see that so often these days. It's and then the amazing. next picture. <laughs> um, so one of the very famous products of Sichuan is salt from Zigong in the south. So 
This is quite amazing. So since the Han Dynasty, 2,000 years ago approximately, they have been producing salt in Sichuan from mines. So they had um, mining equipment going into the earth and pulling up brine. Um, and they had um, oxen uh, moving the yeah. wheels to draw up the brine. And um, then they, uh, and that's why in southern Sichuan you have some beef dishes like the zhegong shui ju niu ru, the, the, um, it's called water boiled beef, but it's a very spicy dish, because Chinese didn't traditionally eat much beef, but in this area they had some, you know, the oxen who had worked in the, the yeah. mine. And then the even more incredible thing, so this is the brine, this is a one, they've got one old salt mine, which is like a museum now, so it's still working. So you get the salty brine coming up. Oh, can we go back, sorry, yeah. to that one, yeah. And then um, they simmer it in pans to dry it out and make the salt. And it's fueled by natural gas, which they also mine. Incredible. So this is just, anyway, it's yeah. just really interesting. And people say, you know, people say that in order to make really the best Sichuan pickled vegetables, you have to use zugong mineral salt because of the flavor. Anyway. But perfect segue to the spices, shall we? Yeah, sure. Yeah. So, because obviously you guys all have these beautiful little bags. If anybody <laughs> didn't, there's three very suspicious looking ones still standing there, so that makes me think that three people don't have there. So, go ahead and grab them. Yeah, so I think first, let's have a look. So, there are some spices which you really find across China, and um, these ones, the star anise. Um, Taohuo, black cardamom, and cassia bark. So, um, in in Chinese cooking, you have um, there's one preparation called lu shui, sometimes called a master um, stock or a flavor uh, a flavor pot, where you make a stock and you flavor it with quite a lot of spices. I mean, maybe at the simplest five, but maybe a couple of dozen spices. So you get this wonderful aromatic broth, and then you simmer all kinds of things in it to give them a flavor. So um, things like um, you know pork, um, pigs' um, tails and ears, very nice cooked this way, um, sort of um, duck gizzards, livers, tofu, boiled eggs, all kinds of foods. And you simmer them in the broth, which is usually colored either with caramelized sugar or with dark soy sauce or a mixture. And so the food gets spiced and um, and also coloured, and then you can you sort of maybe in Sichuan you would often have these meats cold, slice them up and serve them with a dip of ground chilli and Sichuan pepper. And um, so black cardamom, so that's related, you know, re related to the green cardamom which you use a lot in Indian cooking. Um, and um, hold on, let's have a look. Should I help you? Yeah, so yeah, so these are these are quite small ones. So often they are quite big and they're the size of nutmegs and ridged. And you can smell that sort of slightly cardamom y smell. For so sharing ones I'm gonna grab okay, over there. Yeah. So these are quite these are small, like normally they're quite a lot bigger, but you can smell that smell. So this is something that um, wouldn't go into a dish usually on its own, but would go in a spice mixture. Um, and star anise as well. Um, you probably it smells amazing, though. I mean, is it smoked or is that itself? Um, I'm not actually sure. It is smoky, isn't it? I'm, it I haven't seen smoky, it yeah. prepared. Yeah. And um, this is the star anise, which I'm sure you know, um, which is again um, yeah. used often in quite small quantities because it can be quite overwhelming if you overuse it. Um, oh, I love that. I, this is one of my favorites. Yeah. And the other function in Chinese cooking. Um, there's a concept going back more than 2,000 years um, in cooking, which is that animal ingredients like meat and fish, they have slightly unpleasant aspects to their flavor. And there is a whole vocabulary in Chinese to describe these off tastes. So xin wei is like a fishy taste, shan wei is a muttony taste, and sao wei is like a foul taste, like from some offal or kidneys. And the job of the cook is to sort of um, to kind of refine away these rough edges of natural flavors of meaty and fishy foods and bring out their lovely, delicate, umami savoriness. And so 
That is why um, in Chinese cooking, for example, you, you often see ginger and spring onion shaoxing wine in marinades because it takes away, you know, it takes away that roughness. So you still taste the pure fish, but it just tastes better. And if you don't believe, because I use, you know, it sounds very esoteric, but if you try, for example, if you make a, a stalk out of pork bones, if you add a bit of ginger and spring onion, it will just taste lovelier. Mm. Anyway, so it's something that Chinese chefs talk about just all the time. And it's actually not just Chinese chefs, but actually I, I wrote something about this recently, but sort of in Arab cultures and Indian and um, Iranian, there are all these culinary cultures, just not Western ones, where people have this concept that you have to do something with animal ingredients to make them taste better. Yeah. And, and funnily enough, I suspect that that is why in Western cuisines we use lemon with fish or yeah. vinegar with fish and chips. It's doing the same thing, but we don't think about it the same way. But anyway, so that's another function of spices. So you often find with, um, like if you're cooking, um, say, mutton or beef, which in Chinese palate is a heavier, kind of slightly rougher meat, then you might add spices. So you might add a bit of star anise, whereas you probably wouldn't with pork, which is very delicate. And, and, so, and this is cassia. So this is Chinese cinnamon. So mm. the, the sort of um, cinnamon Thank that, um, you know, the, the cinnamon that we, we normally have in pastries mm. and things is those very thin quills, which are from the spice islands in Indonesia, I think. Is that right? Yeah. Um, yeah, but they're very delicate cinnamon. cinnamon. So this is a bit, um, you know, it's coarser bark. Um, but this is often, and these spices are often added whole to stews and things. I was just about to ask if you, what would you do with them? Grind them up or? Well, you can, so, you know, when you have a five spice mix, it doesn't necessarily mean five spices. There are also like, like 13 spices, yeah. like 18 spices. So there are, when you have spice mixtures, sometimes they will be to toasted and ground up. But um, often they use whole, so I, I just use them whole. So if I'm making certain kinds of stew, I will just add them whole. Yeah. Anyway, now we move on to the Sichuan department. So, um, so this is so this is really spice, but this is um, Sichuan chili bean paste. And Josephine, very carefully, who's organising this, got a brand that I really like from Chengdu. So this is one of this kind of seasoning is one of the heart and soul of Sichuanese cooking. So it's made from a particular kind of chili, Arjin Tiao, which grows near Chengdu, which is a sort of long horn-shaped chili, not too hot and very bright red and fruity. And um, it's made from broad beans or fava beans. So the beans are, are molded and then brined for some time. Then when the chilies are harvested, they're chopped up and they're all mixed together with a load of salt. And um, traditionally they put in clay pots yeah. and just matured for a couple of years. So. This is one thing, and, and one of the things about Chinese food culture, not just Sichuanese, is the, is the fermented bean product. It doesn't exist in Western cuisines. Like, we had lots of beans and lentils, but we didn't ferment them. We fermented beer and bread and yep. meat and cheese, but we didn't ferment beans, and that's like an absolute dividing line in technology. And of course, fermented beans were incredibly important in China. So for more than 2,000 years, people have been fermenting soybeans to make black beans, you know, like in black bean sauce. Literally, they've been doing it in the same sort of way for more than 2,000 years. And also making thick sauces called jiang, which were originally made with meat and fish and then with soybeans and also with wheat and other ingredients. And these are, and then later, soy sauce, which was the liquid runoff from fermented soybeans. But these are just not only very important in the distinctive flavor of Chinese and later Japanese Korean cu cuisines, but also nutritionally, because um, before the advent of um, modern fertilizer and farming methods, the Chinese agricultural system sustained more people per unit of land than any other system. And wow. one of the reasons was this intensive sort of agriculture. They didn't have a lot of land for grazing cattle, but they had pigs and chickens, which sort of worked around the land, you know. Yeah. And then they, a lot of the nutrition came from bean products mm. and, and tofu later. But anyway, so this, is, so this one, um, have a good sniff. Normally this is fried before you eat it but it's got that wonderful, savory, spicy taste. Thank and you. a lot of Sichuanese dishes, oh, including amazing. mapo dofu and um, 
uh, twice cooked pork and hot pot, you start by sizzling this in oil very gently so it makes the oil red and totally delicious and then you add other ingredients and this is another just on a separate point mm. that um you know a lot of people in the west are now you know we all know we have to eat less meat right for environmental reasons and chinese cuisine offers a lot of exciting possibilities and one of the reason is that you get these very rich umami tastes um that you in vegetarian ingredients so traditional Chinese cuisine uses a little bit of meat, many dishes, a little bit of meat to, like in mapo tofu is a dish, so it's mainly tofu, it has a little bit of minced beef and it has this gorgeous paste. And it's satisfying if you're a meat eater in the way that meat is. And there are so many dishes like that. So anyway. Yeah, I'm vegetarian and I have to say that this is a question I also asked you when I got the book and I was like, what should I cook? I'm vegetarian. And you like, cook anything just don't do the meat. But yeah, yeah, I mean, they're yeah, not really yeah. excellent, but I mean, and, and they're just satisfying. So you yeah. can sort of, you can eat less meat. If you eat Chinese food, you can eat less meat without noticing it as a deprivation. It's just equally satisfying. And then this is citron pepper, which, um, that again... Let me give you a hand. Oh yeah, this one. So, um, this, we'll start with this one, the red one, which I think is unlabeled. Red citron pepper? Ours has, I, maybe you'll have. Yeah, so... So Sichuan pepper is the sort of distinctive Sichuanese flavoring, I mean, as well as this, but this Sichuan pepper is the original Chinese pepper, Jiao. So in, it was, it, it's mentioned in the oldest Chinese literature. It was found in tombs dating back 2000 years ago. It was, um, it was a medicine and a fragrance before it was really a food. And um, much black pepper came into China later, about 2,000 years ago. And the name of black pepper in Chinese is still Hujiao, barbarian pepper, because it came from abroad. <laughs> and the early name of chilies in China was Fanjiao, barbarian pepper, different barbarian, sea barbarians this time, because <laughs> it came from overseas. And actually, the Sichuanese still called chilies Haijiao, which means sea pepper, again, because they're foreign. Uh -huh. This is pepper for Chinese. Now, the thing about citron pepper is that it produces this tingly, numbing, numbing sensation. Have a good sniff. Have you, have you all had citron pepper before? Yeah, because it's funny, when my first, when that, I have the not. first edition of, okay, I'll give you instructions. <laughs> so when my, the first edition of my citron book came out 20 years ago, in the West, practically no one had had good citron pepper, and even Cantonese people often hadn't, because although Cantonese people use citron pepper, they don't use it for the numbing quality. It's a, anyway, so the important thing with citron pepper is that it can be quite overwhelming. So take a couple of them. If you haven't, well, you might like to anyway, but especially if you haven't had it, but just take one or two, and then put a couple at the front of your mouth, chew them juicily about a few times, and then take them out and wait. Okay, now take it out and then wait a minute. Ah, that's so cool. <laughs> oh, it's delicious too. Yeah. It's almost citrusy. Yeah, it's related to citrus, yeah. Oh, now it's really tingy. So you're getting the nice singy <laughs> yeah. sensation in your... So, um, yeah, so this Take is, it it's like, just like as chilies produce a physical sensation, it's not a flavor, in the, a taste in the yeah. classic sense, it's a sensation. So um, citron pepper produces a physical sensation of tingliness in the mouth. And, um, yeah. I love it. Yeah. So, um, and then, so green citron pepper, there are lots of different varieties of citron pepper. The red one is the traditional pepper, but um, there are also lots of wild varieties of citron pepper. And in the 1990s, one of them was licensed for use in food. Um, and they're kind of green citron pepper. And green citron pepper in the last 10, 20 years has become very popular in China. And it's even more fruity and zingy with a bit of a lime flavor and sometimes even more electrifyingly zingy. So the green citron pepper, try that too in the same way. Um, but that's a sort of new, it's sort of old and new because it's, it's related obviously, but it's a slightly different take on citron pepper. And it's absolutely lovely in fish dishes goes beautifully with sort of fish and you know you can make a fish soup and then finish it with a bit of sizzle such and such. how is it 
Because and, and also it may be because this is it, mm, licensing. Beautiful. It. Yeah, and this um, this is from there's a young um, guy from Chongqing who actually lives in Washington D.C. who started a business called Fifty Hertz Foods, and he's just doing citron pepper and citron pepper. Really, and this is from him. Because um, the problem is that sometimes if you go to your local Chinese supermarket and you just buy any citron pepper, it won't have that zine. And for citronese dishes, that's what you're looking for. Yeah. I love it. It goes back. It's sort of full circle because the texture and now the, the actual feeling. It's yeah. such a beautiful right, connection. I have a ton more questions.